Welcome to the Crash the Pond podcast. We are back. It is a Monday, March 7th edition of the show. Jake, this is this is going to be a busy show. I think the last few weeks we've had, you know, we've had decent topics, but but this week we've got a little bit of everything. We've got coach, we've got uh, I should say trade rumors, we've got free agent talk, we've got games to talk about. It's 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 going to be an interesting one. We've got quotes from Pat Verbeek. Yeah, yeah, great quotes from yeah. Pat Verbeek, actually. Yeah, there's so, there's so, a lot to do. So yeah, I think we should just we should just attack it. Yeah, you know, like like they say in life, you want to take take the bull by the horns. So that's what we'll do with the show. Should note though, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that Jake is wearing a pink hat and a blue floral print shirt. I mean, we've established this a lot. Um, one of us has to provide a visual entertainment element to the people watching us. And you know, what? sometimes I uh, I decide to throw on some colorful things to entertain the people. Why Why are you throwing shade at my gray T shirt? Yeah, you know. And uh, <laughs> one of us decided to throw on golf attire for this one. Yeah, I'm still not understanding how that's golf attire. You just you look like a skateboarder. It's golf attire. It It's just It's just not. It's golf attire. <laughs> it It simply isn't. PC um, okay. man is saying my hat's nut hat is nuts. Thank you. I'm taking that as a compliment. Nuts. Yeah. Let's go with that. Taking um, it as a compliment. I mean, it's not a bad hat. I'm not knocking the outfit. It's just the choice. The, the choice is what I'm pointing out. Some of us choose to be bold. Some of us choose to not be bold. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, I guess I'm a coward then. Noted. Noted. Oh, you putting, putting da- words into yeah. your mouth. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't even own like clothing of that of that caliber of, I guess, noise, loudness, whatever the term is you want to use. Maybe you should up your game. I... I should uh, give credit though. This was actually a very late birthday present to me from one of my good friends. So, oh, you know, there you go. You know, wow. Look maybe at you. maybe give... maybe you should stop hating on it. <laughs> wow, team player, I like it. Okay, let's um let's talk about let's talk about the let's get to business. Here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to start with this because I think it's the it's the most interesting. It's it's the most novel. Uh, Saturday night hockey night in Canada. I'm watching Canadians Oilers. Who, by the way, Canadians. One again, uh, seven over their last eight. Martin St. Louis, coach of the year. But regardless, intermission show, Jeff Merrick drops a bombshell on all of us saying that Max Contois' name has popped up in trade conversations around the league and that it's it's intensifying and kind of doubled down on it on 32 Thoughts of the podcast where he was saying that just don't be surprised if, if something happens there. And mention it again this morning on the Jeff Merrick show. Yes. So what's your reaction to that? Um, my initial reaction to it was similar to when Jeff had, I think Jeff was the one who had the little bit of little tidbit on Troy Terry last year. No, it was Friedman. It was? Yeah. Okay. Well then never mind. Scratch that. But regardless, (laughs) my, my feeling on it is the same, which is that this feels in some ways like it's coming from his camp because he has been misused by the Ducks coaching staff. He has not been put into a position to, to succeed for most of the year. He's an offensive player, and he's mainly been playing uh, with Isaac Lundestrom and Jacob Silverberg for most of the season. And I'll look that up just to confirm. I'm just curious to make sure on that. But um, this feels like his camp's trying to get out there that he needs a change of scenery because the Ducks aren't utilizing him correctly. Mm-hmm. And I've brought this up many times with, with Max Comtois. His play this season is not that much different than his play the last their last season. And that's not necessarily meant to say his play last season was that great, but it's meant to highlight the fact that when you're relying on points and points solely to judge a player, you're going to get into this habit of um, going as shooting percentages go. And I think that's what's happening with Max Comtois here for the Ducks and for Dallas Aikens on the whole and it's funny because the flip happens with Troy Terry. Troy Terry last season just had an awful shooting percentage and mm-hmm. unsustainably low. This year, unsustainably high. What's the praise for him? He's this changed player, all these things. And Confidence. He, yeah, and he's getting bounces, and that's the biggest thing. And he's been played great. Like, his play is elevated. There's a whole lot there for Troy Terry, obviously. And, yeah. and it's, it's, not, not just, it's not just shooting no, percentage. With no, Terry. but it, it, it kind of highlights the fact that when you put guys into good positions, they start to score, and those kind of low shooting percentages start to normalize. And so, just so you know, Max Comtois is shooting 4% this season. 
Yeah. So down 13% from last year. So (laughs) if you're looking for a reason why the coaching staff is down on him, that's probably the biggest reason why, because he's just, the puck's just not going in as much, but um, he's, he's also, he's also taken a step back at five on five in terms of driving yeah, offense. But I don't think it's a huge one. Uh, I mean, if you, at least if you look at the RAPM charts, that's maybe fair. his, indi- maybe his individual shot rates yeah. are similar. Yeah. That's but, what I'm talking but about. Here. When he's on the ice. And I mean, the whole point of RAPM is to kind of isolate. Like, that's fair. The ducks are like, he's a negative value right now in terms of driving offense from an expected goals. Yeah. So his, I, per perspective. his individual expected goals per 60 has gone down from 0.9 to 0.76. He's shooting the puck a little bit less 6.6 shots on goal per 60 to 5.89. And this is an all situation. So it's gone down a little bit from uh, an individual perspective. Um, and then from an on ice perspective, I mean, he's kind of basically where he was at last season. 47% expected goals for last season, 48% this season, um, 2.29 expected goals, f- maybe a little bit more low event, 2.9 expected goals for this season, or per 60 this season, 2.36 last, 2.59 against last season, 2.43 this. So a little bit more low event. All this is to say that if you're looking for what the biggest difference is, right, it's that shooting it, percentage. And we've well, talked it, about this before. Well, so the biggest difference in, I would say, just to kind of clarify what you're saying is the biggest difference in terms of his perception and the reason he's being used this way is because of the shooting percentage. Correct. Because, because last season he was definitely a flawed player. He was, he had shown improvement in driving offense, which he had not shown in the past, but was horrendous defensively. And the, the shooting percentage kind of masked all of it, made him uh, a staple in the lineup this year. You, you, you pull the carpet out from underneath him. And it's just what are you left and left. left. Exactly. And that was kind of what we talked about last season and why I think both you and I were in some ways um, saying it wouldn't be a bad idea to look at look at moving him and selling him high in the summer because he was shooting unsustainably high and maybe his on ice numbers weren't as great as that. And now it's kind of the flip side of that. Right. His Mm -hmm. his on his perception is an all time low. And this quickly, it's kind of changed. Um and I think for me, kind of circling back to your original question about what were my thoughts, I think it would be an awful idea to move him right now, mainly because you're selling at an all-time low in terms of his value. Right. Well, it is. I will give you your flowers here, Jake. Last season, you did mention that Contois was a good sell-high candidate mm-hmm. uh, because there was serious regression potential this yeah. season. And lo and behold, that's exactly what's happened. And the narrative is completely flipped. And I do agree with what you said in the beginning, which is that I don't think that this is a rumor coming from the Ducks. I think that, let me let me phrase it a different way. I don't think that the Ducks are looking to move Maxime Contois. I think that they would probably prefer to have him in the organization because he's a cheap young player who has shown potential in past seasons. There's no reason to trade a guy like that unless it, there's no reason to trade him for the sake of trading him, right? I, it yeah. just doesn't make sense. So, to me, just logically, it, it would have to be coming from the player side, and I think that the player is is kind of justified. Like, like, yeah, he's frustrated certainly, and also, I mean, you heard his comment right on at the intermission last night where <laughs> Ali Lozov asked him, you know, about you know just his play and the season and he's like yeah well i don't play very much but just and there was kind of like this little awkward moment where it's like oh you 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 touched you you flew a little too close to the sun there max uh being a little too real there but i mean it's frustrating i'm sure and i and i think there's two sides to the coin which is for one max contois is i maybe an overused phrase in this show or in our discord more appropriately there's two sides to the coin though which is for one max contois is I think a a fine player, or at least just an interesting player, right? He's got he's got potential. He's shown that, and and for that reason, you want to see him play. You want to see him get more opportunities. The other side of the coin is that he is a very flawed player, and to me, just on an eye test level, and I think the numbers kind of back this up. There hasn't been a lot of improvement in his game yeah, over fair. the years. Like I, I think you watch him play, and it's like the player that we see today is not that much different from the player we first saw. I mean, when he had his first cup of coffee in the NHL, like he's still not a great skater. He still hasn't added a lot of skills in terms of small area skills. I don't think he's really developed a shot, you know, like outside of the kind of that inner slot area. And it's just tough to hack it in the NHL when you're not expanding your skill set. 
You yeah. know, I mean, I'm sure he's gotten more physically fit. I'm sure that there's there's things to his game that have improved, but it's just it's tough from that perspective. So for me, I think I agree with you right now. There is no sense in you know doing this change of scenery thing if you're the Ducks, unless he just completely wants out and it's this toxic situation. Yeah, uh, completely agreed. Um, it, and yeah, it, it's something where it just doesn't make any sense to move him right now. Yeah, it, unless like, it's like because even if he's let's say packaged in, yeah, right, that his his value in that package is lower. Yeah. And so you're not getting as much mileage for including him. Yeah. So it still doesn't make sense. Yep, exactly. But I, but, but I will say this, and I think this is an important clarifier. I am not against trading Max Agreed. Coltois. Agreed. Agreed. Like, 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 people should not be taking this as me saying that, oh, he's this immovable asset. No, everyone has a price. If if it makes sense for the team, if it makes sense for the kind of this, this long-term vision that Pat Verbeek is building, then yes, you do it. Um, I, I'm not against trading him. It's just, it's gotta, it's gotta make sense and it can't be at, yeah. at actual rock bottom in terms of his trade. Yeah. Value. I mean, that was my kind of going back slightly, but that was my whole issue with the Isaac Lundestrom or not Isaac Lundestrom with the Andre Kasha <laughs> trade was, was that you right. were selling at an all time low in terms of value and you can have your own opinion on that trade, but I kind of stand by that and that's where, where this is at still. And so I don't necessarily, yeah, but Jake, they got, they got Axel Anderson out of it though. Yeah. <laughs> I just broke him. I just Jake what, is just what, would you would you do right Comtois now. for Jake DeBrusque one for one? Yes. Yeah, I think like, I would like, also. Like what? Yeah. Like, I don't think any. I don't think the Bruins would. Yeah. No. Um, um. I don't know his contract status though. Maybe that that's part of it. Yeah. But so anyway, I I think that it's kind of a weird, like, it almost kind of feels like a nothing rumor to me, right? Because. Do you think the Ducks are shopping Contois because a disgruntled player and agent? Well, have it feels like the, the Terry situation. So I fully buy last year as well, and you did bring up the Terry thing that I I do think that Terry was disgruntled and was unhappy with how he was being and used, rightfully so. Yeah, and and much like I would say had an even stronger case than Contois. Yeah, and I think this year has has been has been vindicated for his frustration, and so the. The problem is I with with Contois, I don't know if there's this big upshot for him next season. Where if let's say he stays with the Ducks, um, he can he can make everybody look silly for for having you know maybe not had as much confidence in him or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I I think it's not there's not a Terry esque breakout there. No, waiting. There, there could be a shooting percentage bump. Well, that's the thing. So that's that's what you're hoping for if you just want to kind of recoup some kind of value. Yeah. I mean, if it if it were up to me. I would just stick it out with Contois and just, I mean, first off, I would tell Dallas Sakins to play him because, I mean, this is, oh, this is the other do you, just do you sickening. Want, do you want to just get yep. into last night's game? Well, no, hold on. The, the, I, this is an important point. Yeah. The, the sickening aspect of the narrative to me that, because Jeff Merrick is at the heart of all of this and he keeps saying, oh, well, uh, Anaheim's left side is, is tough to crack. They, they're, they're deep on the left side. And that's like, okay, let's think about who's actually playing left wing for the Ducks before we start saying that uh the, like these are the guys that are playing ahead of maxime contois nick delorier and you've got Derek grant who's also played a ton at, at left wing is it tough to crack or is dallas akins just once again incapable of properly evaluating the players he has in front of him and sam Steele playing on left wing also a lot right so i don't think it's a matter of like <sighs> If, if, if you're anyone who's heard that and you've believed it for a second, don't because well, it's not it's not about that. And also it, Adam Henrique playing on the left side when Ryan Getzloff is out and instead of playing center. Right. It, it's just this whole thing that, yes, there's a lot of bodies on the left side, but that doesn't mean that they have to play those specific guys. Dallas Akins has chosen to value a player in Nick Delorier whose great biggest value add is fighting. I mean, sure, the the fourth line has been better of late, but anyway, the whole point is just that it's mm. it's unfortunate that it's gotten to this point with Contois because it it feels like it didn't have to to get I, here. I was just curious to see if it's still this way. Nick Delory on the Athletic uh, through Dom Luchizian's uh, Luchizian's model uh, with GSVA is still projected a negative zero point two million market value. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, according to Alan Walsh, that model Dom Luchizian just has no credibility, mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw that. I did. Twitter Entertaining. Um, yeah. 
But I, I think this is a good transition point into last night's game with Max Comtois drawing back into the lineup with yep. uh, with Ryan Getzloff hurt. Sam Steele was uh, put into the first line center role with Adam Henrique and Troy Terry. Uh, and then we got Raquel Milano Zegris, um, Comtois with Lundestrom and Silverberg, and then Carrick, Grant, and Delore on the fourth line. Um, and I mean, it sucks how it happened, but. Yes. Dallas Akins had his hand forced because the thing that stuck out to me so much with that lineup was when Sam Steele had been placed in the first line role or quote unquote first line role previously, it kind of, you could squint and maybe say, okay, there's not really a whole lot of other options. Like I was like, maybe try Troy Terry there. Who knows? But Terry has never played center at the NHL level. Last night I looked at that and I was like, Adam, are, are we forgetting that Adam Henrique for the last, what, five years? Six years? His, uh, his entire career for the most part? Yeah, like has been a center in the NHL. And why is he playing wing instead of Sam Steele? And I guess if you want to make the argument of development, things like that, want to give Sam Steele the looks at those roles, sure. But that doesn't jive. Like, it, it feels two-faced a bit if that's the logic there because that's not what – essentially Dallas Higgins has been doing, but regardless of the point, um, and kind of the duck's hand were forced because Lundstrom went out very early in the se- early in the game and it forced the ducks to essentially shift Sam Steele into the Lundstrom role, move Adam Henrique to center and push Max Comtois up into that top six. And so the bottom six was a completely fluctuating thing with someone on the wing with Lundestrom and Silverberg, whether that be Terry from the top six or someone from the the bottom line or the the fourth line. But the end result of this game was that the top six played the most at five on five by a significant margin. I think it was like they played 70% of the game at five on five and the bottom six played the other 30%. Um, And what ended up happening was the Ducks played maybe one of their best games of the season at five on five. They dominated play to the tune of 69% expected goals, four percentage and Max Comtois looked really good next to Adam and Reek and Troy Terry. Part of that is Troy Terry had a master full game. He just was on a mission. The entire game was dominant in the ozone generating chances and being on that line with him is going to be really helpful to Comtois. But that's exactly what we've been talking about of putting it, put him in positions to succeed. Put him in positions where he's going to be able to thrive, where he's going to get looks, get chances. And he set up a goal for the Ducks last night with that shot that ended up rebounding off Adam Henrique. And so kind of back to the original point where the Ducks were forced to have a top six. And what ended up happening? They were dominant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of those guys posted great numbers. They they looked great by the eye test. And I mean, I think I've said this jokingly on Twitter before, but if I coach the Ducks... I would simply play the best players the most. That's it. That would be the only change that would be really needed because Dallas Aikens doesn't do that for the most part. Um, and so last night being the exception to the rule, you saw the result. And I mean, you you mentioned this today, but I initially thought, well, a lot of this is just the Sharks are bad. And yes, they were also coming off. Of, they were on the tail end of a back-to-back, but the Sharks and Ducks aren't that far apart at five on five in terms of their underlying numbers. Yeah. So, that makes it look better in hindsight because it's not purely, okay, you're beating up a bad team. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this was a game where yet again, the ducks were, didn't get great goaltending. They haven't gotten great goaltending really in weeks. (laughs) Yeah. Since since before the all-star break really. Yeah. And we'll get get to that. We'll get to the Vegas game. Yeah. And and (laughs) they were able to survive and, and that's what they've had to do. And that's honestly what made them so successful earlier on in the season was the fact that they didn't get stellar goaltending to start the year. And they actually yeah. had to rely on good five on five play to, to lead the way. And that's what happened last night. And, um, it, it's really, it's good to see. And while it was something that for uh, kind of Aiken's hands was forced into doing this, I hope that he can maybe take a lesson from this of, Hey, and, and granted, this is wishful thinking on my part. And yes, also I'm it, of, the, I'm of the opinion of he's not going to be back next season. So it doesn't really matter, but I guess maybe from that global perspective, this goes to show what could happen if you optimize that top uh, optimize the lineup and create a top six that you play most of the game. Well, yeah. Cause I mean, that's, that's been a bit of a frustrating narrative around this team as they've kind of fizzled out in terms of their playoff hopes, 
right? I mean, if you look at the standings and you squint, you can maybe try to trick yourself into saying that they're in it. But with the games in hand that the other teams in front of them have, it's just going to be really hard. Um, but it's there's been kind of this almost like fatalism of, well, this was, this was always going to happen, right? That the, this hot start was never going to sustain. And, and this is just who they were always going to be. And it's like, well, kind of, right? We, no one expected them to be a great team. No one expected them to... It, it, wasn't, to, to, it to, wasn't smoke and mirrors to start. I think Right, that. But, it, but it also wasn't smoke and mirrors. And there is a path to at least sustain that to a degree. And again, part of it is the COVID rampage in the first, you know, in January and late December. But also it's just Dallas Aikens, again, continuing to prioritize playing his third and fourth lines over just rolling well, his horses. That to me has felt like the biggest shift in the the mentality for this team. If you recall, like don't think too long ago, uh, Derek Grant was waived. Yeah. And, and Nick Deloria was in and out of the lineup and that was all happening when the ducks were playing extremely well. Mm-hmm. Like that was not when they were playing, they were playing poorly and they were trying to jumpstart guys, things like that. That was when the ducks were playing legitimately extremely well and yeah. they were scratching Nick Deloria and Derek Grant on the regular. And, what changed since then is that those guys are playing big minutes. And I yeah. think that there's an easy correlation that can be had there of, well, there's kind of your change is that they're being put into bigger positions and the ducks are in some ways suffering as a result of that. Well, it's not just that those guys are playing bigger roles. I mean, I guess it, it should be obvious, but it, it it's probably helpful to say it is just that the more minutes those guys play, the less minutes, the good players play. And you're just taking so much value off the table in the long run doing that. Um, it is strange. It is a good, it is kind of an interesting question of how did this happen? How did we get to this point where Dallas Aikens tricked himself into thinking that his best shot at winning is coaching this way? Because like you said, in the beginning of the season, we saw like, I, I guess whatever is slightly more than a flash of Aikens, I think coaching a, a good game and it just kind of went away. I think that as he got desperate, maybe, I don't know. I mean, he's certainly under a lot of pressure because we he, his future is uncertain. Uh, it's just it's backed him into a corner, but it's just the the decisions that have come out of that have just not been good. Yeah, so. Raquel's goatee saying, uh, "What change is no Bo Grew? Shake my head, future Selkie candidate." <laughs> yeah, Bo Grew. Yeah, remember those days? Um, oh. Okay. Well, so do you want to? Okay, let's get your brief take on this uh, controversial overtime goal. Yeah, against the Sharks. Yeah. Con- con- controversial because it legitimately should have been a penalty. Yeah. It, the, like, it should have been. It was too many men on the ice. Like, I mean, here, I'll just read the rule for everyone. The it, It's much easier when you just put it this way. Because, I mean, there are people, I, I just want to make this clear. There, There's this part of the rule which basically says when a player is retiring from the ice service and is is in within, is within five, the five feet limit of his player's bench and his substitute is on the ice, then retiring player shall be considered off the ice for the purpose of Rule 70, leaving the bench. So that has to do with basically if the guys are – a line, legal line change is allowed to happen when the guy coming off the ice is within five feet of the bench. And for the purposes of leaving the bench, um, the person um, coming off the ice is considered off the ice at that point in time for a penalty of a guy coming onto the ice for last man in, things like that. But in very specific, in the too many men on the ice portion of it, it adds after that – if in the course of making a substitution, either the player entering the game or the player retiring plays the puck or who checks or makes any physical contact with an opposing player while both players involved in the substitution are on the ice, then the infraction of too many men on the ice will be called. And if you look at it, when Ricard Raquel is able to grab the puck and he uh, makes that play, Adam and Reek's skates are firmly planted on the ice. He is yeah. not on the bench. He is standing by the boards. Just because he's within five feet does not mean that it is allowed. Um, if he is on the ice, physically on the ice per the rule, um, for rule 74, which is too many men on the ice, it's a penalty. And so the goal shouldn't have happened. Good good break for the Ducks. The Sharks are definitely um, right to be aggrieved, to be angry about this. Um, but, uh, I mean, the Ducks took advantage of it. And, uh, I mean, Ricard Raquel, Ricard Raquel trade stock. Yeah. Ricard Raquel trade up. stock. Uh, yeah. Being within the five feet doesn't, there are people kind of saying in the Twitch chat, he's within five feet, no penalty. If that's the case, then when the puck's thrown by the bench, when people are making changes, you see guys jump over the boards and things like that. 
That mm-hmm. wouldn't happen. The five feet rule does not matter for too many men on the ice with playing the puck. That, right. That's exactly. the key part is the playing well, it, of the puck. And I feel like that even in the commentary, I feel like that got kind of blurred because you're because of the exact distinction you're talking about. And people are thinking about a standard line change, kind of not realizing that there is a key distinction when the puck is, like is involved. The line change was completely fine if Henrique is just on the bench. Well, that's the thing. And I mean, like my reaction was initially the same, which is that, oh, you know, this happens all the time. This is kind of like your normal late, you know, kind of these changes are a little sloppy. But when the puck is being played, you just read the rule. That I mean, it it changes. It's no longer yeah. The, it's it happens all the and, time and, scenario. And if you want to say, well, and here's the thing: people say it happens all the time and things like that. It's it's a missed call, but and there are missed calls that happen all the time. But in the same way, if and I mentioned this to you before we started recording, if there's a hook in the defensive zone, and it leads to a breakaway the other way, the team that got hooked would be pissed. It's right. the same situation. And yeah. this is a penalty by the letter of the law. It's a hook. and Or not a hook. By the letter of the law, it's too many men on the ice. Uh, Henrique skates are on the ice. If I mean, the real issue I have here is why wasn't someone opening the boards? You uh, the door? Yeah. Why Why isn't yeah. someone opening the, the, opening the door there for Henrique to jump on, or jump on the bench? Why isn't Henrique jumping onto the bench also? Yeah, well, here's the thing, though. I mean, we're getting a comment, but as someone who hashtag played the game, no player actually understands too many men. Too many men, they just panic. Yeah, but there's a reason they panic if the puck goes well, near the bench because you're not allowed to play it if you have too many men. That's why that should have been a penalty because you had four guys on the ice and one of them played the puck. Yeah, right. Like if the, the puck doesn't get played there and it just go and it goes down or whatever we're not having this conversation. Yeah, and I mean the the rule it's is be, it's because the, he played it. It's why the, guys try to jump. They don't want it to hit their the, skate. The rule book is cut and dry. And I think that that at the end yeah. of the day is the beginning and the end of the story for the situation is sure you can say well the refs could call it this way or could call it that way. The rule book says this. That is what they are instructed to enforce. Yeah. If they don't enforce that, it's a blown call. That's it. That, yeah. Like that's it, that's the end of the story there, and like that is why I say it's a blown call. Like whether yeah. that whether I think it's the right decision or wrong decision, it's a blown call. And it's not meant to take away from what the Ducks did. It's not meant to also to go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm gonna go for it. All I was gonna say is that um, notice how they didn't ha- uh, have Silverberg on the ice to start the. Well, no Lundestrom or Silverberg. I mean, that was the first thing I noticed. Was oh wow, they're gonna gonna. Go and try and win the game. Interesting. Like this is the 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 madness of the uh, Lundestrom Silverberg duo to start overtime. It's like you're not winning, you're not winning the game with those two out there. You're, you're like this whole notion of oh well you're you're controlling the play. You're you're kind of making sure the other team doesn't score. It's like well that's like you've already got a point in hand. Like you got to go and get the next one. Yeah. It's it's not time to play it safe. Yep. Um But yeah, so it was a blown call, but. I mean, whatever. Like, I, Duck- I hate getting into I, I hate getting into the rule stuff because you get you get all the debates. But well, th- that's the thing. There's only I, there's only one. There's actually only one right answer when there's a rule book. Yeah, like that's the thing here <laughs> is like I. It's not really a debate worth having because the rule is the rule, and right. if it wasn't enforced correctly, then it's a blown call, and that's the end of the story. Right, and that's I mean, not and, and that's not meant to be argumentative. That's just how it is. Right. I mean, Adam Henrique was still on the ice. He's still a player in the field of play. Ricard Raquel was also on the ice and he got the puck. Yep. That. There's your too many men. Like in that moment, it like the, the buzzer goes off, but the refs missed it. Yep. And Adam Henry was finish. just getting off. Great finish. Yeah. I, I mean, mean the, look, du- the Ducks really benefited from a couple things in that game. First off, the Sharks going offside. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That. Well, also, Logan Couture just kind of like, I don't know what went through Logan Couture's mind on that play where he just basically completely spaced out because he saw Henrique going back to the bench and then I he scans and you can see that he makes con- eye contact with Ricard Raquel and then just stares back at, at Troy Terry playing the puck all, like all the way on the other end. So that that was a little bit intriguing yep. to say the least. Real quick, okay. just pointing this out, Poker Puck says, but you said if he's within five feet, that's okay. The five feet is only meant if it's a legal line change or not. 
So the line change mm-hmm. is allowed to happen if the guy coming off the ice is within five feet of the bench. But if he's within that five feet and the guy, either him or the guy coming onto the ice plays the puck, then it's too many men on the ice. Doesn't matter how close they are with uh, how close they are to the bench. It if they play if two guys are on the ice and they yeah. play the puck, then there are six guys on the ice at that. Well, in this case, four guys on the ice when it should be three on three. Yeah, I mean the the, the distance here is kind of immaterial because of the playing oh, it of might the not puck. be immaterial, but it's the playing of the puck that renders that move. Um, it's just not what we're discussing. CJKHL with the great comment. Couture is very dumb, to be honest. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 not a. I mean, even though he's correct in arguing the call, it's not a great look when you were the guy who could have done something about it and you just kind of <laughs> kind of got caught puck, puck watching. Okay. Uh, do you want to talk about the Vegas game? Or should I, we do a, an ad read? I think it's time for an ad read. Okay. So this episode is brought to you by Green Chef. So uh, Green Chef is a, a meal kit or meal uh, kit service. And you can enjoy your greens. It's the most sustainable meal kit. Uh, you can enjoy your greens while being green. Green Chef is the most sustainable meal kit, offsetting 100% of their plastic packaging in every box and 100% of their carbon footprint and emissions. Green Chef's pre-portioned ingredients means you'll actually reduce your food waste by at least 25% compared to grocery shopping. And then Green Chef's also extremely convenient and easy. They make it easy, uh, or they make cooking easy so you can spend less time stressing and more time enjoying delicious home-cooked meals. Their uh, meals are pre-made and pre-measured so- or have pre-made and pre-measured sauces, dressings, and spices so you can get more chef-curated flavor in less time. You can avoid long lines at the grocery store. Green Chef is so convenient with their pre-portioned, easy-to-follow recipes that are delivered right to your door. And with fresh produce, premium proteins, and organic ingredients, you can trust Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. They offer 35 nutritious and flavorful options to choose from each week, featuring premium clean ingredients that are seasonally sourced for peak freshness. Green Chef's always changing variety of easy to follow recipes means there's something new to discover each week so you never get bored. And because they're the number one meal kit for eating well, um, they give you a lot of different options for every different lifestyle. Uh, they include keto plus paleo, vegan, vegetarian, fast and fit, Mediterranean, and gluten free. Whether you're looking for carb conscious, gluten free, plant based, or calorie conscious options, or you just want to have delicious, balanced dishes, Green Chef has flavorful, good for you recipes that are sure to satisfy. And as the first ever and only keto meal kit on the market. Green Chef makes sticking to carb-conscious lifestyle easy. So, Felix, what's on the recipe this week for Green Chef? Yeah, so the one, I mean, so they've got this weekly menu, and Italian-style surf and turf Ooh. looks amazing. Yeah, so you've got steak, you've got shrimp, you've got shallot, green kale, hazelnuts, Parmesan cheese, a little cream cheese, Italian herb, it's freaking delicious and it's healthy. Um, it's low carb, so you can stick to your your keto lifestyle, gluten free. Um, that's the beauty of Green that, Chef is that that, that also it's has, actually delicious. That also has the Chef Select uh, portion. That uh, treat yourself to a fine dining experience with this premium recipe. Some other things on the the menu are mozzarella stuffed pork uh, meatloaf, uh, beef meatballs with Creole Dijon. Um, I've mentioned this before, but their meals are fantastic. We save the recipes no matter what, whenever we get them, just so we can always try them again because they always end up absolutely delicious. Um, so with that being said, you can go to greenchef.com slash CTP 130 and use code CTP 130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. Once again, that's greenchef.com slash CTP 130 and use code CTP 130 to get $130 off plus free shipping. That's once again, Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Yep. So go check that out. And with that, let's talk about the Vegas game. This was, this was an interesting game because let's just say that up to a certain point, and by that, I mean uh, before Trevor Zegers scores, at which point the, the Vegas Golden Knights are basically running over the Ducks. I mean, it's 5-2 to two at that point. You know, they've scored three unanswered goals. It almost felt like, okay, you know, this is not a healthy Vegas team. They're, they're missing Mark Stone. They're missing Max Pacioretty. This almost feels like the nadir of the Ducks season. Like, mm-hmm. if, they can't, if they can't get it done 
in this kind of cushier match. I don't want to say cushier matchup, but a more favorable matchup with Vegas. I mean, you're at home and they're not at full strength. They're missing key players. What can you conceivably get done? And on top of that, John Gibson is not having a good game. It just felt like this was going complete. Like this was this was the season once again. This is this is the season just continuing to spiral uh, down the drain. But instead, once again, Trevor Zegers gets it done on the power play. A fantastic shot along the right side um, to bring Anaheim within two. And then in the third period. Troy Terry also getting it done on the power play. He's very good, don't you think? Troy Terry is very good. And it was just this exciting comeback. It was a it was a great effort by the Ducks to to make it close and and to and not just to make it close, but to do it in style. I mean, if you look at both the Zegras and Terry goals, these are I mean, first off, Troy Terry, the the move to the backhand from the right oh, side. Oh yeah. So I've said this a couple times, but that's not an easy play, even though you could say maybe Brossois is, is you know, too far low, on his post deep. there. Yeah, but the thing is, so that's a goal line play. And maybe Brassois should be a little further out. But the way that Terry kind of lulls him to sleep, fading to the goal line, and then puts all his weight onto that right foot so he can cut to the left, and then extends, like he, he does this thing where he kind of extends out his hands. So he creates a new shooting angle. And he can just perfectly shoot it into the far side. I mean... I know that it's not like it, maybe it's a little hyperbolic, but sometimes some of the stuff Troy Terry does reminds me of Pavel Datsuk because just like the, just the creativity, the kind of, but it's also scientific where you, you can see what he's doing and how he's doing it. And, and it leads to this fantastic result. So again, like it was an impressive comeback. All these great yeah. things were happening. Ultimately the ducks fall short. And I think at the end of it, you're kind of just left wondering, well, you know, it's well and good that they came back, but they also put themselves in this awful position and they don't have anything to show for it. They lose in regulation. Is it time that we have the conversation? The John Gibson conversation? The John Gibson conversation? Yeah, I mean, look, I've I've been a defender in recent weeks, you know, saying, well, you know, fatigue, this and that. But the trend is the trend. Yeah. John Gibson has, has not been good since the All-Star break and there's different you know hypotheses that you could come up with you know is it fatigue is is he banged up and and Dallas Aikens has alluded to all of those in their in his press availabilities but the fact of the matter is that he a he's not played well and b the Ducks are doing a damn thing about it like they're no like they gave him maybe one extra night off for the for the San Jose game the the first San Jose game and it's just like what is the plan here it and you know and I mean it also doesn't sound great when Dallas Akins gets asked about this and he says, well, our goalie coach is off scouting for in a faraway land. And so we'll, we'll have to convene on that. It's just like, it, it just seems kind of like a rudderless ship when it comes to managing John Gibson. So here's every game since the all-star break, Seattle, negative 1.85 GSAX, Calgary, negative 2.15 GSAX, Edmonton, negative 3.26 GSAX, Vancouver, negative 2.36 GSAX, LA, negative 2.7 GSAX. Boston, negative 0.91 GSAX. Vegas, negative 2.62 GSAX. Yeah. It like, hasn't, hasn't been good. And, I mean, I, I would have to update this, but after Friday's game, uh, even – so Anthony Stolarz had a better – so a better save percentage when you compare his expected versus his actual to John Gibson. And, you know, he hasn't been the starter. He kind of He kind of gets maybe – the softer games at times, but Anthony Stolar has been damn good this year. And at a minimum, at a minimum, he should just be playing more. Give John, like John Gibson is one of those guys where when he's at his best, he can carry the team Mm -hmm. and he can, he can put you in a different category in the standings by his play. What's happening now though, is the opposite of that. The other side of this coin, which is that when he's not on his game, he can bring you down in the standings because he's just, he's, he's burnt out or whatever. You got to keep, you got to keep that engine running however you can. And you have one of the best backup goalies in the NHL and Anthony Stolarz, and you kind of just refuse to play him any more than just kind of your average backup. And I think that that's, that's the big failure of the Ducks is that they've, they have this great asset. They have this, this, this great value in John Gibson, but they have no idea how to, how to manage it and how to optimize it and how to get the most mm-hmm. out of him for the longest period of time. Yep. Uh, and real quick, want to mention, so... Since the All-Star break, negative 15.86 GSAX. And I want to mention this because Austin Price brought this up, and I think we do get new listeners all the time. 
And so he asked, what stat is that exactly? So this is GSAX per Evolving Hockey, which is goal saved above expected. And so you hear us mention expected goals all the time. What this does is picture expected goals kind of in reverse in some ways. So you're looking at the, at the expected goals that the team should have allowed and then looking at the actual goals. And so you can kind of backtrack, okay, this per the model that they use this is how many goals the team should have allowed based upon the context of where the shots came from, some of the pre-shot environments that they can account for, and this is how many goals the team should have allowed. If a team should have allowed three, let's just say, expected goals against, and they actually allowed five, that's a negative two for that game, for that goal. Right. And right. so what this is saying is that he's allowed 15.86 goals more than expected. You, so essentially... Cor- less. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sorry. Yeah, more than, yeah. than expected. So if you were... Pl- replaced him with a goalie that was just straight up zero replacement level right at expected the ducks would have allowed 15 less goals yeah which is a huge difference that, I mean, 15, especially this time of year 15 goals over one two three four five six seven games that that's two goals a game yeah like you yeah. you you take two goals a game off some of those games were blowout so it doesn't really matter but some of those games were tighter and, and so you take two goals off uh, in some of those games and it's a tighter game. The ducks have a better chance of winning. Um, yep. and, and so, I mean, it's a big deal and it's a big deal. I mean, just for reference, he was on fire during that road trip. And so, um, I mean, this is my view of goaltending on the whole. And I think this is important to keep in mind. Goaltending streaky. Mm-hmm. There's going to be guys that have hot streaks. There's going to be guys that, and every, or every guy's going to have hot streaks. Every guy's going to have cold streaks. The thing is, the best goalies in the world can limit those cold streaks to a couple games instead of being a run of five, six games. And the thing is, that's what we're running into with Gibson right now is this is a five, six game stretch of Mm -hmm. just really poor play. And eventually it's going to come out. He's going to come out of me. He's going to look like a world beater again. But the truly elite goalies are able to limit these types of stretches. I mean, I, I feel like now we should all kind of acknowledge that, yes, he is extremely streaky and that, you know, that this whole kind of yo-yo narrative that we're having where it's like, oh, well, when John Gibson is playing great, you have the people that come out of the woodwork and say, oh, can you believe that at any point John Gibson was criticized? How how dare people ever point out that he was not good for a couple of years? And then when he kind of reverts back into the play we've seen, those people go quiet. And it's well, just like, or, well, or it's well, it's... Or it's the, the team in front of them or what have you. It's, well, it's the system. Or it's the flip side of the, the torches and the pitchforks come out. And in reality, the answer lies somewhere in between. Yes. yes and I think exactly. that that's the reality of a lot of this. Real quick, before we kind of move on to other inf- other stuff, let's just really touch on the Boston game. And just because that was before. Well, there's only one thing that matters. Tonight. Exactly. Tre- Trevor Zegers. He is an absolute treat. I mean, forget the goal. The goal. I mean, the goal is amazing, but you know, it's it's just a great shot from the left flank. Uh, I mean, in a. I mean, you you can't you can't say the word clutch enough times to to describe that situation. Twenty two seconds left, but really, what it comes down to is the celebration, the celebration, the fist pump, down on one knee, right in front of the Boston bench. As soon as I saw him do that, it reminded me of his celebration in the World Juniors. I think it was against Russia. Or was it like, Canada? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Where he celebrates right in front of their bench. You know, and that's why people get jealous or don't like Trevor Zegers because he can does it, stuff like that. Can we also talk about the fact that, did you hear this? Jamie Drysdale said this, I guess, yeah. on the, the audio or the post-game show on the radio feed. Um, but basically, Trevor went up to him and said, uh, give me the puck, I'm scoring. Yeah. On that power play. And yeah. so, basically, when Drysdale got the puck, he knew to move it to, to Zegers, and then he finishes it. Mm -hmm. so i mean it's just a ballsy play ballsy to call your shot and i mean he's he's just a special talent i don't think there's any other way to put it i think he's someone that obviously there is still some development that needs to happen in his game but he is one of the most special talents the ducks have had in a very long time yeah and was it that game or no it was the vegas game where he took a he took a a critical face off at the very end and you could just hear brian in brian oh yeah, yeah Oh, they're letting Zegras take the. It was just like, oh no! It's like, yeah, this is what development looks like. You you gotta let him swim at some point, right? Yep. Or try to swim. But anyway, so it was a. I think they just lost ha- it, and they still ended up with possession. 
They did. But so just add that moment, though, that Trevor Zegers goal to the list this season. I mean, yeah. how many moments are we at now with him where I mean, it's just he, he's able to captivate the audience? That was kind of what we talked about last year and, and how even in the poor season, they still had some moments. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the important things with this year was give fans a reason to care. Give them I mean, some they've, moments. They've, they've done that this year. No, no I know. And that's my yeah. point is that how many times has Trevor Zegers done that this year? And that's a that is such an important thing. Because how many kids are going to look back on the season? They're not going to remember whether they made the playoffs or not. They're going to no. remember Trevor Zegers throwing his stick into the, the bench. They're going to remember Trevor Zegers flipping the puck over the net. They're going to remember Zegers scoring with 20 seconds left in the game. Yep. Those are the memories that you're going to have. And they're etched into your mind. And I mean, I can think back to when I was in college. And there was, I think it was just, I think it was a regular season game where the Ducks came back and won. And Tamu, uh scored i think it ended up being late in the game to win and he was like jumping around same thing like those are what sticks out of your mind lubimir vishnovsky's hat trick where he scored the the game time goal with like 10 seconds left in the overtime winner like these are the things that you want to happen because the you may not remember every bit of that entire season five six ten years down the line but you're gonna sure as hell remember those moments right exactly and i also do want to point out in that game and, and as a whole, I think that Jamie Drysdale has looked pretty good as of late. People um, can't say you're harp, you're uh, you're so negative on him anymore. Well, I mean, it's just I'm watching him play, and I know I mean, I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> I mean, he's making plays right, and I yeah. think he is getting he's getting better slowly. It's not perfect, but he's getting he's getting better at once he's transitioning the puck into the offensive zone to make something happen with it to get to the middle or to dump it off. It's interesting because if you look at all the tracking stats, he's one of the best guys on the team at, at gaining the offensive blue line. But then in terms of what actually happens next, which is, you know, sh- shots off of entries, he's he's far below average in that regard. So I think Jamie Drysdale is kind of figuring it out. I think that he's going to – I'm more I'm more confident now that he, there's – like, I guess I'm just a little higher on his potential now than I was at the beginning of the year. Cause you just, re- you weren't really seeing it a ton, right? It was just a lot of, okay, I'm going to wheel it all the way down the ice. I'm going to turn on the jets, but then don't really know what to do. And I think now the cerebral element of the game is clicking a bit more. And I'm, I'm just excited to see where it's going to go because uh, I mean, if he can hit that potential as an elite transition guy and a guy who, I mean, is showing to be effective in the offensive zone, especially on the power play, with all the talent that the Ducks could conceivably have up front, that's just going to be a really fun team to watch. Yeah, so. it, it definitely is. And I think one of the biggest things is, I mean, he's still 19. <laughs> not for long. I know. Not for long. You, when is, you, when is you're you're going to be so happy when that happens. How do I not have this memorized by now? <laughs> uh, no, uh, but April 8th. Holy crap. We're, we're, by the time you're listening to this, we're, we're exactly a month away from Jamie Drysdale's birthday. Oh, I'm I'm more excited than he is. <laughs> I'm more excited than he is for his for, for his own birthday. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. But okay. no, but but there like there's a lot of room for growth, and and that's an important thing to remember. There is that that that's when and, we and, I, and his numbers have also been better. Like yeah. they're not great. They're they're still like they're they're not what you would like, especially playing with the guy next to Hampus Lindholm, who supposedly is this elite defenseman, but the numbers are improving slightly and that's also encouraging. Yep. Um, all right. Want to move on to, uh, some trade rumors, Pat Verbeek talk. Well, let, let's, let's dip in a little bit just to the, the free agents because we're going to get asked about this. I would imagine a lot once we get to questions. Yep. So let's, let's try to get some of the basics out of the way. Let's start with the biggest name. The one we've talked about the most this year, Hampus Lindholm. So, I mean, we've already kind of known this, but it just keeps getting reiterated on different podcasts, but that the Ducks don't want to don't want to give Lindholm the term. They don't want to they don't want to do the crazy well, mega deal. So, what El- and I think here's the important thing. What Elliot Friedman said today on or I guess yesterday when they recorded, but on 32 thoughts that came out today, he said that the thing for the Ducks is with all of their free agents, they don't they do not want to give out term. Mm-hmm. And that is the big sticking point. And he's like, maybe they'll make an exception for Lindholm because they like him the most. But he's like, that is the biggest thing for the Ducks is they are. But he, but he also he also added that he still can't really see it. Yeah. With making the exception. So yeah, and I mean, here's the thing, and, and this is the important thing to remember, and this is what I've said with Lindholm, just kind of looking at contracts, right? Because I think that's an important thing to look at. And 
I think with some of the discussion that's happened lately on Lindholm, it's, I think, really informed where I think this is going to go. Um, but I think if you're Lindholm, the starting point in any negotiation with the Ducks is the Cam Fowler contract, which right. was eight times six and a half. That is the starting point, and then it goes up from there. Because Lindholm has been used as the number one defenseman, really, over the last however many years, with Fowler being the number two. And I don't think, and whether you want to dispute, that's right over the last couple of years. But prior to that, Lindholm was better than than Fowler, I think, pre-Aikens coming in. And with usage, Lindholm has been up there. And then you also factor in UFA and, and inflation into this. When Fowler signed that deal, I think it was 2016 or 2017, and the cap's gone up since then. I think it's gone up by four or five million since then. And then the market's also gone up along with that. Defensemen are getting a whole lot more. I think when Fowler signed six and a half million was a whole hell of a lot. Yeah, um, let's let's see. So the so it would have been eight point six seven percent of, I guess, the cap at the time when he when Fowler signed his deal. And we're at so, what eighty one and a half now. So nine would be actually would nine be above ten percent of what the cap is now. So, yeah, yeah. So it would be about seven mil or so now in, in, so, in, in the current deal. So yeah, so I mean that's kind of the baseline. Yeah, for for Hampus and eight, eight times seven, and, and so if that's the baseline, that's the starting point for him. And I think it goes up from there when you compare yourself to the market value that Seth Jones got. And with and people may think that's crazy, but and he doesn't have the production. But look at the way people are talking about him. Yeah. Like exactly like that's kind of what's informed my opinion on this. Look at the way Friedman's talked about him. Look at the way Mm -hmm. Merrick's talked about him. Look at the way I was listening to the Chris Johnson show today. Look look at how he talks about him and the fact that he is the number one rental. If he's available ahead of the the, 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 the perception uh, is that he is an elite defense ahead of Claude Giroux. Like, yeah, that, that Lindholm would be the number one rental on the market. And I I think all of that kind of goes to show that if that's the perception because these guys aren't just getting aren't, aren't coming up with that information on their own. These no. insiders get fed information by by people. And so that that may be in some ways their opinion on the player, but it's well informed from other people in the know. And so if that's what they're being told, then Lindholm is going to get in the eight million dollar range, eight to nine million dollar range, probably at seven years. I think that that easily could happen on the open market. And so if you're him, why would you not like what would make it where you would sign for the Ducks? Right? Exactly. Like and that, the, the only thing is getting yeah. the eighth year. And so he probably wants eight years for eight and a half mil. Well, and I think that's why you can easily say, confidently say that Lindholm won't be won't be a duck past the trade deadline because it's like just put the blocks together, right? Term like like you said, he can he can go out and get this amazing deal on the open market. The only, the thi- only, the only leverage well, the Ducks have is the eight years. Well, that's what I'm saying. So that's oh, what sorry, I'm getting. Sorry. That's what I'm getting with this is that the only thing that could make it worth it for him comparatively to stay with the Ducks is if like th- that's their only lever is that extra year, and if the Ducks don't want to give him that extra year because we've heard over and over that term is important, then how could you see this ever actually happening? Right, it just seems completely incongruent, and of course, this could all be BS. This could all just be posturing from both sides. But I think that it, there's enough there to say, okay, the positions here are so at odds with each other that I don't know how it ends up happening. The Ducks would have to. It feels like the only way that they can make it worth it and not give him all that term is to pay him a like grossly overpay on the AAV, and I just. I don't think they're going to do that either. Well, and right? what would you have to do to really make that worth it, right? Because exactly. you, you, you got to think he would be getting, let's just say he gets that seven times 8.5. That's 59 and a half million. If he ends up getting, uh, let's just say a five-year deal, right? That's a mm-hmm. $12 million deal. $12 million <laughs> yeah. AAV. Like it's just you're not you're not doing that. No, like it's it's crazy. And, and he's and here's the other issue with the eight eight years. He's 28. He'll be 36 by the time that deal's like done. how many how many examples of defensemen aging poorly do we need? Players aging poorly on these mega deals do we need to realize that maybe you shouldn't do them, especially when you're negotiating against yourself in a way. There's no other. There are no other teams like you. Like you were texting this to me before we were recording, but. If you really want Hampus Lindholm, try to get him in the summertime. Yeah. Like trade him, get the assets, 
and then take a run at him when he's a UFA. Yep. And like, like you could you, you could have the potentially the best of both worlds. You're running the risk, and I don't think that would happen with Lindholm because once again, terms the issue. So mm-hmm. the, that seems more likely a situation with Manson and Raquel. Sure, but 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 the point just no, being I, yes, that it, yes, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. I I, I don't think Hampus Lindholm is going to be a duck for past the trade deadline. No, I don't. I mean, yeah, painful light brings up. Look at the example of uh, Vlasic and San Jose. I mean, that's. And that's been a comp for Hampus Lindholm for years, yeah. right? Is the defensive defensive defenseman, and it's just yeah. Now there's also been chatter. I mean, did you have anything else in Lindholm? Uh, I don't really think a whole lot more. I I think the return could be massive, though. That I'm starting to settle in on the return for Lindholm could be big. Yep, yep, and then which Josh is all Manson. the more reason to tr- to trade him. Yep, and so Manson. I mean, the rumor today from Frank Cervalli is that there's just not a lot of chatter and that maybe he's the guy that the ducks end up keeping. I don't know if I'm missing anything there, but that's, that's the gist of it. And you disagree. You think that it's just cause he's been hurt that there's not. Yeah. Much I chatter. mean, who knows? I, I, I think that the injury probably quiets the chatter. One thing that's also been was brought up, I think by Chris Johnson today on his show was a lot of the, a lot of it's really quiet right now. Because if you're a team in the market for a rental, you're typically going to be uptight against the cap and you're really trying to maneuver that cap. So the closer that you can get to the deadline, the more accrued cap space you can get prior to acquiring that guy. Mm-hmm. So especially with Manson being hurt, why would you trade for him right now when you can't use him and have that cap added to your cap sheet? Yeah. So no, uh, yeah. So the so the whole quiet narrative, like, because because the additional comment was just, oh, he's the maybe the defenseman likelier to resign with the Ducks. It's like, well, yeah, sure. Like we all know, like we've mm-hmm. known this for a long time that if you're gonna say who's likelier to stay, it's probably Manson because well, yeah, he's not gonna break the bank the way that Lindholm. And is. it sounds like uh, family wise, he wants to stay. And yeah, like it, it sounds like he's probably not gonna play hardball to on his contract like Lynn Holm is. Yeah. But even having said that, I would like, if that's the case, even more of a reason to trade him and just sign in the off season. Yeah. Because he would be willing. He might be more open to that. Yeah. And so you can even tell him, Hey, if you want to be here long-term, this helps us long-term. This gives you a chance at a cup. Sure. You have to go away from your family for a couple months and that would suck. It also gives, it also gives you a better chance at a cup here. Yeah. Long-term. Like this is a win-win where if you're a GM that is cerebral, it's an easy sell to your player of hey, mm-hmm. you like it here, hey, we we'll, we want to bring you back. Like this like this is such an easy easy situation for that. And same thing with Raquel. I I think that Raquel is, could also get a lot on the open market. Um actually Raquel's the one I have the best idea for both contract and trade because mm-hmm. he's basically Tyler Toffoli at this point. In terms of production. Yeah. In terms of production, and that is what matters for all of this, yep. right? Yep. I like, mean, yeah, that's he, except for defensemen. The mm-hmm. year that Tyler Toffoli was traded from the Kings to the, the Canucks, um, he uh, Toffoli was on pace for just slightly less goals than Raquel is on right now on a goals per game pace, and they're basically spot on the same exact points per game. Yeah, so, and, and Raquel's hot right now. So. Yeah, Raquel's hot going into the deadline. Yeah, and I think with... The, circling back to Manson a little bit though, Go for it, I sorry. will say that that he's been, I think he's been the, I mean he's been better than Lindholm this year. Like I think he's having, he's having a quietly solid season. Like nothing's nothing special, nothing nothing outstanding, nothing that you want to sign him to a significant contract to, but he has been quietly effective. And I don't know how much longer that can last with kind of his his injury history and and just the way that the Ducks roster. I mean, how long can he stay tethered to, to Cam Fowler? But I mean, like, he he's he's a guy who, if you re, if if you're willing, if he's willing to stay on for a team friendly deal, it's probably the one I feel maybe the least anxious about, just because I think that that I don't know. I just feel like that there's less room for disaster there. Like than if there is he with ended like up Lindholm. signing a deal at for like three times three, and was your th- oh yeah was your third line or third pairing defenseman, third pairing right sh- right hand shot defenseman. In a lot of ways, he's been above replacement level this season, and yeah. so if if you're getting that, maybe a little less than that for three years, like that's that's fine. Yeah, like that's you I mean, could do a lot worse. I stand by my point. I wouldn't extend him to that right now. I mean, his market well, value same. is at two point two. 
per same, athletic. But, 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 you know, we all kind of have to have that in the back of our heads of, okay, well, if someone is staying around, if it does happen, yeah, who are you most comfortable? And for me, it's, it's probably Manson, not so much because of the player, but just because of the cost, the kind of the, the cost benefit perspective. Yeah, of that's it. fair. That's fair. So, um, and then anything you want to add on Raquel? I mean, he's hot at the perfect time. I think he's getting traded, and there's just not a whole lot I mean, else to it. They've just, now just helping his value. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was a new trade bait list posted on March second, and Ricard Raquel is tenth on that list. Hampus Lindholm is fourteenth. Josh Manson is also on the list at fifteenth, and then also down in like the forties. Forty sixth is Nick Delorier. If they don't trade him, what are they doing? Yeah. Like right, I mean, he's scoring goals. He's wearing the A. Do you right? trade? Do you trade Sam Carrick? Does Sam Carrick have an, any value to be traded? I do wonder about that because I guess my wonder is just what's his per, what's the perception league yeah, wide about? Agree. Like, is he just is he just another fourth liner to most NHL teams? Because I don't think a lot of NHL teams are looking at. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how many NHL teams how much they're valuing his underlying numbers because yep. he has been good and he's been good for the Ducks and. You could probably get him back in Anaheim for a pretty cheap deal and just have a cheap, good fourth liner around. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just don't know really what you could get for him. It just We just don't know. Maybe yeah. he has higher value than a Nick DeLore, and we just haven't heard about it. Yep. And I guess speaking of analytics really quickly, uh, before we move on to questions, because we'll do yeah. that soon, seeing as we're over an hour in. Um, yeah. But uh, there was a uh, Q&A with Pat Verbeek with the orange Alliance members and Eric Stevens there and kind of reported back some quotes. Um, and also we got some information from our good friend, Bonnie, who was also there about this. And so, I mean, one of the things that stuck out was essentially, I mean, what you could imagine would stick out to me is the analytics portion of it and how yeah. it didn't feel like it was just lip service. Um, it's something that Verbeek said was a uh, high on, or in his high. Uh, he's got his high. Yeah, focus I, can, on. I can, I can read the quote here Go for in it. front of me. Yeah, he said, analytics are, are clearly something I have a high focus on. You can really use it well along with coaching and the scouting aspects. I think you can merge them in such a way that will be beneficial, not just in finding players, but helping players develop their game. Analytics also play a key part in contracts. In a cap world, you're trying to find the best value you can for players. We're looking to improve our sports science department. Analytics and sports science will go hand in hand to help us understand what a player's potential is to get stronger and to physically improve his skating ability and things like that. So to me, the big key distinction here between what you've heard the likes of Bob Murray and other GMs say about analytics is that you kind of get the lip service of, well, they're, I mean, you, Bob Murray has been on the record saying, well, analytics are a tool, right? They're a tool, but I'm an eyeballs guy, blah, blah. You've heard him say this and it's kind of just lip service, right? Whereas, or it's, it's just, it's a little abstract with Pat Verbeek. He's telling you here, like specifically where analytics help mm -hmm. and in what way. And I mean, he brings up the cap perspective and how this is what allows you to identify value contracts and also talking about with coaching and scouting. Like, like, yes, th these are things that are happening every day in the hockey world where, I mean, you're seeing it with scouting, right? And guys like Byron Bader and how much, draft analytics and prospect analytics have changed the way that we can forecast who's going to be good and who's not going to be. And on the flip side of that with coaching, right? We've, yeah. we've been harping on that all season. And so I think that if you're a Ducks fan hearing what Pat Verbeek is saying here, you have to be ecstatic because this is exactly what this organization has needed for, for the better part of the last decade really yeah. is just to have an information based evidence based approach to decision-making that's beyond just what do my eyes tell me because yeah. it's a fast moving game. There's a lot happening. You can be a grizzled veteran. You you can be a hockey lifer like Bob Murray, but you're just not like, it's well, just the human cognitive bandwidth only goes so far. You can't catch everything. And that's where analytics really showed their value and finding the value, especially on um, like the fourth line. Like when thinking about like a guy like Sam Kerr, if he ends yeah. up getting moved, if you don't resign him, the way that you fill in that talent is by using your looking at some numbers and utilizing those to help you uh, identify players that could be good fits. Not looking at the uh, Derek Grants, not looking at the Nick Delorius, finding different players to fill those roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, and, and it's 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 understanding things from a cost value uh, ratio, which is important as well. Because I think with Bob Murray, there was always kind of this weird 
Like it never, the, the numbers never made sense for these contracts, right? When you're signing, when you're going out to get guys like Nick Delorier, Derek Grant, and it's just, so anyway, it, it's just good news. Be happy about it. Is what I would say. Yep. It, 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 bo- it bodes well for the future. And, you know, assuming that, for example, Jeff Solomon stays in, in the fold, like it just seems like the ducks are getting smarter very rapidly. Yep. Yep. Agreed. All right. Time for some questions or anything else? Uh, I do want to ask. So the NHL trade deadline is March 21st. So yes. we are two let's weeks, see, two weeks away. Oh, boy. We're, we're just, I'm just going to be feverishly checking my phone every day for the next two weeks, I guess. Oh, let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. The Ducks go on a road trip right now. They get back yeah. the week before the deadline. I forget which. I think the first home game is a week from Friday. What happens first? The Ducks trade someone off the team or they get back from the road trip? Oh, wow. As uh, in, g- give me the trade. Okay. Give me the trade. Okay. Yeah. Give me the fun option. Yeah. Um, all right. So we'll get into some questions. So we're going to start with our Discord. Uh, fabulous people at Discord. Um, or was there anything else you wanted to say about the deadline? No, no okay. I, th- I think I think I've got everything. We'll, we'll plug the Patreon in a little bit. But uh, Travi Bear asked this uh, while we were recording last week, and it's still relevant. Um, do you guys know or to, uh, how do you guys think the Russia-Ukraine situation is going to affect Russian prospects? And so actually as of today – well, with their ability to come over, and especially within the the draft ranking, it was announced today that there was going to be a severance of ties, essentially, between the KHL and the NHL. And so it probably means that it's going to be tougher to have the guys from the KHL come over. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be very difficult as long as this is persisting. Yep. So, so that that's yeah. kind of really the answer to it. Uh, Darko Theory asks, out of D'Lo, Grant, and Carrick, how many get traded D'Lo is bringing up the value, which is nice. I expect him to, uh, to go at least, and the rest of the line has looked good without him. So out of those three, how many do you think get traded? That's a good question because I don't know. Derek Grant is an interesting one because he's got a year after this, and how much of an ax does Pat Verbeek want to take to this roster right now? You still got to finish out the season. You still need bodies. I would guess that out of those three, just Delorier get traded. I'm going to go with w- w- one out of the three. I, the answer that the, the question was just how many I'm going to go with two. Oh, okay. You're going to, I'm going to go on. I'm going with one. Okay. Sharpeno said with Drysdale and pressing recently, will Felix eat crow? <sighs> so I just want to say this. I never said that Drysdale was never going to be good. I never said, in fact, I said the opposite. I always said that there's potential there. Blah, blah, blah. I was just Ooh. saying, look, the results so far are uh, like abominable. That's all I've ever said. And um, I'm not going to eat crow. There's no need. Like <laughs> everything is playing out how I how I said. All right. Shaking Wing says, what do you think Terry, Z- uh, Terry and Zegers will end up point wise? And what would uh, Zegers end up with if Akins knew how to use him properly? Yeah. How many more points would Trevor Zegers have? Yeah. Um, so let's see. Troy Terry currently has 49 points in 53 games. Zegers at 42 and 52. How many do they end up with? Uh, so I think with Troy Terry, he doesn't get a lot of assists. So that's kind of tough. Maybe that, maybe that rebounds at some point. Yep. I'm going to go with, is 65 too much for, for Terry? I'm going to go with 70 for Terry. Terry. Okay. 70. Fine. And then with Zegris, I think 60 is realistic. I'm going to go 65. Okay. There I'm just going to keep one up in you. That's fine. When's Max Jones coming back? It feels like it's going to be soon. Yeah, I don't know. It should be soon. Shake Wing yeah. said, uh, and does uh, their uh, probable point total come close to your – oh, does this probable point total come close to your early, uh, early season expectations? I think it does, actually. I think it, for exceed, Zegris, it exceeds well, it, I think. Well, for, for Zegris, 60 is kind of – I think I had said 50 to 60. Yeah, I think that's um, where we both stood. And I think I think Terry, we were thinking 40 to 50 yeah. range. So, that, I mean, Terry's blowing it out of the water. Yeah. So, um, Briz said, with a team like the Rangers interested in Lindholm and Raquel, what are the chances they are packaged together and what would a return look like? Well, we had a long talk about this last week. Yep. Uh, Capo Caco. You, you want Capo Caco. I don't think no, there's a chance. No way, no way it would happen, but that's Why what would, would the be. Rangers do that is my question. Because they're low on him and scratching him? Are they really? Yeah. 
He's not but playing still, that much. But but still, he's one of your best prospects. Sure. And you're giving him up for two, for re- two rent- for rentals. Well, I mean, maybe they think they can re- sign Lindholm to that eight-year deal. Yeah, I guess. I guess that's not a bad point. But, yeah, I I, I guess I – so I, I made a hypothetical trade. Yeah, Kako's played on, 37 games this year. I said I said Raquel for a first in Braden Schneider. Probably high, probably a little too much. Yeah, but but you know it's 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 always how it is when you throw a hypothetical th- a trade out on Twitter. You get the opposing team's fans that just invade. As I've learned, in, as I learned invade. last year with the Leafs. Yeah, I had the Rangers fans just like talking shit to me for twenty four hours. Basically, I had to mute a lot of people. But anyway, um, I don't know like what the Rangers. I I guess what I've learned is that the Rangers aren't trading anyone. Like like from that like no one of note. Uh, from from that whole exchange, but the Rangers have a lot of younger players. I'm sure that they're willing to give up draft picks. So, but Capo Caco would be an interesting, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. interesting addition. Mm-hmm. I don't see it happening though. Uh, JJ Stone Drums just asked, "How are you guys doing? Doing great. Doing great. Trade deadline's coming up. This is my favorite time of year. I know it is. I, I, I love it. I love it. I, well, I, I'm particularly excited for this one because mm-hmm. I." In the past couple of years, there's just always been that kind of, you know, there's the letdown potential with Bob Murray, and this year I feel like we're finally, we're finally gonna get rewarded for for the misery. Yeah. So Kempafu asks, I know you guys have been uh, off the line a train since he went to Columbus, but 32 thoughts talked about him potentially not returning to Columbus. Do you think the Ducks would go after him, to, or, or the Ducks going after him would make sense? A 23, 20, uh, turning 24 pure sniper seems to be something the Ducks are missing. He may be too expensive though. Yeah, I my Patrick Line stance has uh, yet to change, which is that he is exactly that. He is a pure sniper and does practically nothing else for you. Like doesn't drive play at all. Um, is oh, bad boy, defensively. Yeah. I mean, this is who he's always been, and it's so it's just hilarious to me that it just hasn't really changed. And it'll ebb and it'll flow. But like last season, I mean, he was terrible last season. So I no, he's just a guy who's too flawed for me. He would only make sense. He would only make sense if you're injecting him into like let's say a Boston where you can completely insulate him and you can really maximize that shot. I don't know if the Ducks are there yet. And so that's I would just stay away. Yep. Uh, agreed completely there, especially with what he's going to end up making. Like it's the value what he's going to end up getting is not going to be worth uh worth it at all. No. Um, let's see. Let's go to quick, uh, Twitter questions. And then we'll hit the Twitch chat. Uh, question for the pod. This comes from Justin Beck. Assuming we move all three UFAs of the deadline, what types of prospects Wolverbeek target forwards defensemen are just best available? And what would you guys do? So I think that, I mean, Verbeek has talked about how he wants the team to get stronger, harder to play against. Like that's the brand of hockey that he wants. But I don't think that that's really like position specific. I mean, if you if you look at the if you look at the the the, the pool of talent, I mean, the Ducks have a lot of guys at every position. So I think it's just going to be best available or just whoever whoever is the most alluring of them. But I don't know if position is going to be the huge determining factor. Yeah, maybe I, I'm wrong about I, that. I think you just get best available and then see if you can maybe flip some of them to get Jacob Chikrin. I'm staying on that bandwagon. There's also the whole thing of the college free agents for the Ducks which we haven't talked about yet. But True. That, yeah. That was a Patreon so, question. Do we want to just talk about that briefly now? No, we're honoring the Patreon question. Okay. So we'll say that. I mean, we, but we did get word that Verbeek was scouting the Ducks well, college and, guys. And he specifically mentioned signing some of those guys. And there are some, I think, yeah, Thrun and Lacombe are probably the two highest profile ones. Yeah. I mean, that's like... I think you 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 want to you want to lock them all down because the Ducks I mean, don't have those like, are, that's that's it that's their D pipeline. I mean, those are two that legitimately could potentially make the jump to the NHL next season. Yeah, like you need like you need those guys in your pipeline, and I know Olin Zellweger is great, but he, he's a, he's yeah. a ways out still. Yeah, exactly. Like, like the Ducks are kind of thin if if you lose both of those guys. Yeah. Um. So Trevor Zegers at Zegers Trevor on Twitter sent me a DM saying, "What prospect are you most intrigued by the possibility of getting at the deadline?" Nick Robertson. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess like of who's available. Yeah. Sure. Let's go, Nick Robertson. Yep. There you go, Nick Robertson. I didn't even know he was Jason Robertson's brother. Until Did you today. really? That's bad, isn't it? That's really bad. Yeah, well, shame on me, I guess. Yeah, real big shame on you. 
Um, all right. So now it's time for the Twitch chat. Uh, so for those of you watching us on YouTube, yes, we're on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash crash the pond. There's a YouTube comment that we'll get to later also. Um, or listen to your fa- on your favorite podcast services. We do a live stream of the show each and every time at twitch.tv slash crash pond where you can watch with us live. Uh, you can watch us when we kind of get through all the questions. Go to the crazy shit show portion of this uh, the show. You can also support us. If you, if you have Amazon Prime, you get one free Twitch Prime gaming sub each and every month. Um, and with that, you help support the show more than you can imagine. You can be just like uh, PC Main, who resubscribed for two months, as saying Hat Time Dark with Theory resub for 10 months, Raquel's Goatee, uh, resub for 15 months, and the Womb Raider UW has subscribed also. So, thank you so much to all of you. So, the first question we've got comes from uh, Awesome Price 529. Realistically, who do you think is the head coach for the Ducks next season? Ooh, that is a good question. And also, think- as, also assuming Aikens is gone, uh, do you think he would stay in the organization, but perhaps return to the goals or player development? I mean, do we think he's good at those things? I I think if he's player gone, he's, I think if he's gone, he's gone. Yeah, same. Uh, well, I'll start with this. I don't think it'll be Dallas Aikens, number one. I don't think it'll be any of the guys from San Diego. I, I think that it's not going to be Joel Bouchard or any of that staff. Agreed. So, <laughs> at that point, it's you know I could see Pat Verbeek going a little off the off the off the script and going with a guy that maybe we're not thinking about at all right now, like not a not a revolving door kind of retread guy. Yeah, that would that uh, yeah. would be my guess. I honestly, like it, it, yeah, it, no, but I mean, I'm I'm saying like I don't. We don't really know of ties that he has to like bigger name coaches, so I would guess it'll be something someone we're not really expecting. Yep, I would agree with that. Uh, the Alex Jones asked question, not really a question, I guess, but if you had to pick a surprise player to get dealt at the deadline, who could you see? I think Derek Grant would be my surprise one because we legitimately haven't talked about him at all. Yeah, but but he seems to be valued, and he's got a year left, so maybe that boosts his value a little bit. He's cheap. He wins faceoffs supposedly. So that would be my surprise one. Yep. Uh, Sith Lord Buscemi asked, what's your realistic deadline haul? Three, uh, three first round picks. Is that realistic? Yeah. Do you think they're getting a first round pick for Raquel? Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's a first round pick or you get a second and a prospect. Okay. So let's call it three firsts. Yeah. I think, or in that range, whether that ends up, that's kind of the value. I, at least three firsts because Lindholm will get you more than that. Yeah, by the way, the coach of the Ducks will not be Marty St. Louis, please. Like people are people have been using that against me lately. <laughs> Why are you trying to take the only joy I have in this world right now? Please. The pain Let flight this. asks, uh has Lundestrom usurped Grant's role as the elite one C? I mean, okay, yes. Let me let, I know how to take this question. So yes, he has replaced Derek Grant in the guy who's least deserving of the hype that he gets. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think in that context, it's the, it makes sense. Um, JJ stone drum says question. If you met an alien from a different universe, what's the first meal snack, dessert and drink you give them? Uh, water, uh, meat, just like the basics, you know, they gotta, they gotta understand the fundamentals before we, we move on to the complicated stuff. All right. I'm going to go with first meal. I'm going to give them pizza. Okay. Snack, I'm going to give them a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch. Ugh. Dessert, I you, you really you really want them to like destroy the planet. Dessert, don't you? dessert, I'm going to give them a cinnabon. And okay. drink, I'm going to give them a Passion Wolf Hazy IPA. Wow. This is like the Jake All-Stars. Hey, you it, the question was <laughs> I said water and meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah water and meat i let you off the hook to be that yeah jj stone drum says be specific okay hold on so let's go through it again it was meals meal snack dessert and drink meal snack dessert okay meal probably something with steak like you know potatoes just kind of like a nice hearty meal uh and then snack hmm i don't really snack Almonds? (laughs) Almonds? <laughs> Cashews? <laughs> Drake? Oh, sparkling water. That's good. 
Everyone likes sparkling water. I, I'll say this. Eat my Aston Reese. Great name. Uh, gave me a 10 out of 10 for my list. <laughs> and then uh, dessert. Let's give him some chocolate ice cream. There you go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, let's see. CJK Chell says, guesses on the Ducks reverse retro jersey for next season. I don't think it'll be Wild Wing. No, I don't think so. I mean, what are the options, right? I think it'll be a Jade. Um, you know what I could see them bringing? I could see them what? doing that word script Anaheim jersey in orange and black. Oh, that would be so lame. Um, what I could see them doing is the fourth jersey from like, what was it, 1998? Yeah, 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 with the silver shoulders. And do that in like an orange and black maybe? Yeah, I could see it. Maybe that maybe that's too similar to the current alternate, but I could I could see them bringing that one or just doing a jade uh, home. So you know you just reverse the the original eggplant jade home and just go full jade. Yeah, I and think it's going to be the Anaheim script going orange and black. Which why I do find, you think that? I don't know. Why do you think that? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I I just think it's going to be that, and I'm going to hate it. We need to move on from this. Uh, I'm not a big f- it's funny when I was a kid, I used to think that was a great jersey. Same. And now, same. And now when I see it, I'm just like, there's nothing cool about this same. jersey. Same. Agreed. <laughs> uh, peace. We're probably gonna get hate for that one. By the way, Poker Puck subscribed <laughs> also. Uh, PC Main said, "When does Egress uh, captaincy begin? And do the Ducks roll back to the Mighty Ducks logo with this changeup? You know, that's not an awful idea because Egress has always said like he's a fan of the Mighty Ducks jersey. Yeah, I mean, multiple players in the team have said that. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, whenever Getzlaff retires and then it's going to be a matter of what kind of captain they want next. So it could happen as soon as next season, potentially. Uh, JJ, Jones, uh, JJ Stone Drum says, I think it's just going to be a big picture of Jake's face on the jersey. I I really hope not. I really hope not. Um, oh, Tybal the Fiend Blooded said, I don't know follow much wrestling. What is AEW? Oh boy, AEW is the best wrestling there is right now. I think I think Great. he's just asking for what AEW stands for. Uh, All Elite Wrestling, and okay. it has on. it is Moving on TBS and TNT. It is the uh, competitor they need, to they WWE. They, they don't need your. It, they don't it, need you to to plug them. By it's the way. very. Inter- I'm plugging it for the greater good of everyone because everyone should be watching AEW. Revolution was fantastic. It was long. It was fun. Great storytelling. Wrestling's great. Okay. All right. Let's let's move See, on. See, wait. Ty, any- Tybal the Fiend Blooded says, "I want to know what it is." No, do you don't. Why? <laughs> Why? We don't need that. We don't need just, that in our lives. Just watch it. It's every Wednesday night is Dynamite at 8 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Friday nights are Rampage. It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pa- punching air right now. I'm actually, punching myself. Pa- Painful Light says Felix needs the power to mute Jake when wrestling comes up. Well, it's not that I want to mute you. I just, I just want you to understand that this topic is, hey, just doesn't doesn't resonate. People ask me the question. Uh, okay. Uh, I yeah. The uh, table of fiend blood. It says he likes watching you squirm. I, you know, eh, I don't know why that's a thing, but it is. Um, it is what it is. All right. So I think it's that time. Oh Let, yes. Let's start I feel, with. I feel like you know, it's just it's it, this is like a reward for being. We've been pretty on task today. Oh, we got a question. Late hitter. What was Late it? Late hitter. Oh, question from ninety one Plutie. What are the highest draft odds you think the Ducks can finish this year? As in odds Ooh. for tenth, uh, first overall. I predict we can finish Ooh. as bad as ninth highest odds. I, I don't know because they kind of keep winning these games, and it's. Like, I think the highest is like tenth, especially once they move guys out. Mm-hmm. I think 10th once, highest. Once they do. Okay. I mean, we've established we think they're getting well, dealt, Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Got him. Got him a little bit there. Okay. Got him. So, what do you think? Okay. Uh, yes, it is that time. It's time for recess, basically. Yeah. So, we, we got some uh, places brought up in Twitch that I'll get to. But we're going to be uh, starting with Island Lake, Manitoba. Wait, didn't you say you had a YouTube comment you wanted to talk about? Oh, do we want it? I was going to do that after. Okay. Well, I mean, do do, do whatever. Doesn't yeah. matter. We're, we're, Island we're, Lake, Manitoba. Island Lake, Manitoba. Ah, oh, interesting. Interesting. Let's see. Why am I Why am I clicking on the Wikipedia page? Uh, where Where is this? Where is Where did Lou take us this week? Yeah, I don't I don't trust him. There's a KFC in this town. 
Oh, I'm this, already this, skeptical. This is pretty distant. The fact that there's a KFC is honestly well, impressive. No, so the K, the KFC is between Island Lake and Garden Hill. Actually, let's check the address of the KFC. It is officially in Island Lake, so I will eat crow there. Um, yeah, this is freaking remote. Holy. This this is like in the Arctic Circle, practically. A lot of good... 3.8. A lot of four-star four star reviews. You want to read a KFC review? Uh, well, was let's, was let's, okay. Let's, they just need more staff. For, from four <laughs> days ago. Wow. Wow. That's the high high traffic, I guess, at this... Uh, my favorite one is this one, though. There's from no Lee, street view. From Lee Little. Four, star, four stars out of five of this KFC. Very nice taste. That's it. Yeah, I can't. I can't even do Street View. Here, there is a. Oh, there is an ice rink. There is an arena in Where? Island Lake, though. Where? It's it's the Garden Hill KEC Arena. Why am I not? Is, oh, got is it. Is this not a rink? Yeah, I got it. I got it. It appears to be a rink. It does. Wow. How, so hard, even, you, it's hard to find a place to park there, though. <laughs> park, park what exactly? Your your jet ski or not jet ski, but uh, what's the, snow, the snowmobile? Snow, snow, Why did I say jet ski? <laughs> Oof. Oof. My Canadian car just <laughs> put it in the shredder. It appears that there's like an outdoor rink, though. Interesting. If you go to Garden Hill High School, they have an outdoor rink. And I mean, they, it it's looks... definitely cold enough there. Wow. That's kind of cool. But there is nothing in this town. I mean, there's literally a KFC and an ice rink, and that's it. Like yeah. I, I don't, and then but so, okay, this is weird because there's, there's like a little island that's connecting to it. Stevenson there is Island. A, there is an Island Lake Northern Store, which is listed officially as a shopping mall. There is an Island Lake Airport over on Stevenson yeah. Island. Stevenson so, Island can't even get their own airport. It's called Island Lake Airport. Wow. Yeah, th this is just so remote that it's like kind of depressing. Yeah, let's see the shopping mall. Oh, there's so much snow. Wait, there's a Pizza Hut and a KFC here at the back. Yeah, I'm I'm getting mixed signals on where this this Pizza Hut and KFC is actually located. Yeah, I feel like I'm being jerked around All right. by by the by the people of Island Lake. Austin Price said Cold Lake, Alberta. <laughs> okay, so, I like that name. It's by Kenosu Beach. This is like the most northern tip of like actual like roadways yeah uh there's a waterfront harbor bed and breakfast i mean this is this is too nice this yeah. is too nice let's see i mean see. there's look. johnny waffles on the water wow let's look at the yeah, street, th street view here of what there's a street what are we looking I, at? I, I don't know i'm just i'm just going for a nice stroll around uh cold lake <laughs> cold lake yeah not, there's a north there's a north pizza and what is it called north pizza and yogan fruz what is yogan fruz is that supposed to be something? Where? I have no idea what you're talking about. So in about. this town, there is a store or a restaurant called Northside Pizza and Yogan Fruz. There's a Mamacita's Mexican food. Hold on. I need to know what Yogan Fruz means. I'm Googling this. I, I still don't see this. I think you're making oh, this Oh, it, it's like a company. Oh, okay. Wow. So the, <laughs> so the, pizza, the pizza restaurant shares a location with a yogurt, frozen yogurt place. Okay. Yogan Fruz. Okay, maybe that that makes more sense. Here yeah. we go. We've got a uh, Climax uh, Saskatchewan. Climax. Okay. This comes from uh, ninety one Pluto. He said, "AKA Felix's favorite city." Make of that what you will. <laughs> I, I, no comment. Um, it's actually the village of Climax. Oh. So why is it called Climax? Is it like on the top or the tip of something or like? <laughs> like I just holy this is <laughs> this is just off this the is dirt of... roads second oh, avenue really? is dirt oh that's kind of nice why is that nice well no but you know it's like that's that's a that's a nice feather in our cap we don't we haven't had any dirt roads yeah i think this is the first dirt road that i've seen the the are the, you sure this is dirt it when you go to second second street's definitely dirt i'm on second avenue was there a second street and a second avenue? I, yeah, no, second avenue. Second avenue was definitely dirt. That doesn't look 90, like dirt to 91 me. 91 Pluty's like, this is a uh, letter, Kenny. Definitely. My, fa my no, favorite thing this is, is that this is 100% dirt. My favorite thing is that there's a climax brewing. Guys, please in the Twitch <laughs> chat, confirm that this is dirt that we're looking at. 
I just so there's a there's a brewing company or or a brewery called Climax Brewing, and I feel like if I oh it's not open yet. Interesting. I feel like if I got drunk at this place, I would just be walking around just saying there's a Climax Brewing, like just over and over again. Like I just couldn't help myself. So this is anyway. definitely dirt. Second, <laughs> <laughs> you're just stuck on the dirt roads thing. Yeah, one hundred percent. There's the Climax Community Museum. Oh. Oh. No reviews. Okay. There's an aqua- yeah, there's- wait, there's an aquatic center. <laughs> How? Yeah, don't really understand. Okay. I, I want to see the photos of the Oh, yeah. it, well, they just call- I mean it's just like a it's just a pool. Oh, it's an outdoor pool. Did you think it was an aquarium? I don't know. I thought it was a pool, but I was like why would they have a, it pool, is a pool this it far is a north? Pool. They have a curling. I mean, it's not that north. It's it's on the it's right oh, by the border. Okay, yeah. This is this it's, is south. I mean, it's right by the border of Montana. It's still pretty cold, though. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to live there. CJKHL says so, sources confirmed ESPN that Second Avenue is dirt. So, like, if you're if you're just strolling around Climax, do you say you're climaxing? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the one who's gonna be a dad. What <laughs> what what are you? What does that mean? That was a dad joke that you said. Is that a dad joke? That was one hundred. Like that was one hundred percent a dad joke. Okay. Well, there you go. Maybe I have a unbo- maybe I have a child coming up that I don't know about. Yeah. Um. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's uh. Let's go to the YouTube comment. I feel like this th- th- this has reached its climax. <laughs> wow. Great. Great. We're coming, we're, we're coming down now. Great. Great segue. So here's the YouTube comment. So. Logan Maxwell had reached out to me the uh, the other week, and I think I brought this up. You know what? Mm-hmm. I'm just going to find his original uh, YouTube uh, comment because he's in Australia, and he had mentioned that he was basically uh, needed to try. Did Clima- Climax Hotel. Like, could they have named it something else? Um, like, eat, come eat, on. eat My Ass and Reese is giving your segue a 10 out of 10. Climax Hotel, like. Anyway, I'm, I'll, so, let, I'll, let, I'll let the others draw the conclusion. Here, here was uh, his uh, comment uh, from a couple weeks, or I think a couple weeks ago. He says, always loves the show. Wait for it every week. On another note, this bloody cinnamon toast con- crunch that keeps getting mentioned every month or two has tempted me. Uh, it's not a thing down here in Australia and no way sounds like a healthy breakfast. However, for the not so low cost of $12, including postage, I've, $12? Ordered, <laughs> I've ordered a box of this amazing breakfast. Uh, apparently amazing breakfast. Watch this space for my hot take from down under. And last okay. week in YouTube, he gave us a, a, I really, a, a I, thorough I, review of cinnamon toast I, crunch. I just want to say before you get into the review that I appreciate the, like the, like play by play of this. Yeah. That he told us that he was ordering it. Yeah. Anyway, continue. And he said, so last week on last week's episode, he said, so I had a box of cinnamon toast crunch deliver and sat down with mixed expectations but hoping that it wasn't going to be as disappointing as the LA or Islanders game. I ate a bowl with milk, went to have a second, but didn't have milk left. So I had a bowl. I had that second bowl without the milk. Then the following day, got more milk and polished off the rest of the box. It was so delicious. Thank you for putting me into it. I'm hesitant to buy more due to the rapid rate. Uh, I pliers through, or I think I went, I went through it. And lack of control to stop myself from just one more bowl. It's probably for the best that we don't have this stuff available on Aussie shelves. I'm just so sorry you had to go through that. I'm very happy that we've turned an Australian Logan. I'm happy that we turned you on to the wonderful, don't, wonderful. Don't eat, cinnamon don't eat toast, cinnamon crunch. toast crunch. Just don't. You do still it. have? Do we? Do I expose you right now? I mean, this is known. Also, I guess I learned today that there is a Cinnamon Toast Crunch ice cream. Yeah. Also, which, you can which, just put Cinnamon Toast Crunch on top of ice cream, and it's great. Oh, it, vanilla ice cream so with bad. Vanilla ice cream with cinnamon sugar? You know, this whole, like, the, I don't know what's worse, the ice cream or the cereal, but it all sounds bad. <laughs> I've never tried it, though, so I'll say that. I haven't, I haven't actually tried some. Yeah, toast I mean, crunch. painful light, you're, you're valid. Cinnamon Toast Crunch is delicious, but it's also candy, not breakfast. That's fair. Yeah. Oh my God! Wait, ninety-one Pluto saying, "Did you guys know that BJ's has a cinnamon toast crunch pizuki?" I did not. There used to be a BJ's within walking distance from me, and now it's gone. So, rest, in, rest in peace to that BJ's. Bl- bl- it was a sick one. It was a sick BJ. BJ's. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Oops. 
<laughs> Moving on. Uh, <laughs> Moving on. I don't think I have anything else. That that's. Should we wrap up? Should we should we wrap up? <laughs> that, that... <laughs> I think I broke him. <laughs> I think I broke him. I did it, folks. This this one's for the people. This one's for the people who actually love eggs and avocados. I broke Jake. I did this for you guys. Oh man. Yeah, I'm broken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first climax, now BJ's. This is this show is just this is C- CTP after dark. <laughs> yeah. Use the, the, use the code CTP after dark when this, you go to the climax is this, hotel. Is this the most ultimate shit show that we've had? Can we get the climax hotel to, to sponsor us? That's what I want to know. Can um, we can we get Leaf Rapids to sponsor us? We're we're climaxing the pond. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is really just fully off the rails. Or or maybe just on a different rail. You know, that's also an option. <laughs> Do you do you do you have anything? Left? I have no- anything. I have nothing left. I, I just broke you. You okay. did. Um, <laughs> all right, folks. Well, if you enjoyed uh, what you listened to today, there's a few different ways for you to support that to help you to help us uh, keep this thing going. The number one way is by joining our Patreon page. So, Jake had to turn off his mic because he's so broken. Um, so for one dollar a month. If you do a one dollar monthly pledge, you get to join our patrons only Discord server, which is so much fun. You get to bond with and connect with other diehard Ducks fans. Uh, so during games, it's with trade deadline season approaching, it's a, it's the best time to join because as news are breaking down, you can immediately discuss it with all the great people that we have in there, including us. Um, and it's not limited to just hockey talk. There's also food, a food channel, which is you're gonna get some of the most controversial. Food oh, takes that's what I forgot. You've ever seen. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So, so on the show, if you join us, oh, we will actually read the latest food take from the Food Channel. Um, this has been brought up as what needs to be um, brought up on the show. Okay. This is important to, to bring up. Okay. Within the Food Channel over this past week, there was a crime committed against humanity. Oh. One, one Felix Sicard. Oh no! Decided oh. to try to say that cheese. The show's pizza... not going to end today, is it? The show's not. The show's not going to end today, is it? <laughs> that cheese pizza is not pizza. It's cheese bread. That's in like no. It's cheese bread. No. I have yet to hear a valid argument. Is the pizza is the bread cooked with sauce and cheese on it? Here is what I will say: Is cheese bread ever cooked with the sauce on it? Here is what I will say. Cheese pizza is cheese bread. And I just have yet to hear. You could say it's cheese bread sauce or, or cheese sauce bread, but it's not pizza. So pizza let, let me toppings. ask you this. Where did pizza originate? <sighs> Unknown, actually. Italy. If, if you if you look at the uh, the history books, it's disputed where it originated from. Italy so. and Naples specifically, well known for its pizza. Neapolitan pizza be- is called that because of coming from Naples. One of the... Uh, more iconic Neapolitan pizzas is a margarita pizza, which is sauce, cheese, and basil leaves. Mm-hmm. That is it. You're telling me that that is not pizza. No. What I'm saying is that cheese pizza is not pizza. That is cheese so pizza. So that is, that is a Neapolitan pizza. Nope. We don't that, call that cheese pizza. That is a cheese pizza. No, that is a Neapolitan that pizza. Is, that is pizza with... Well, the, what the, what is what is the difference between that and cheese pizza? It's cheese sauce because, bread. Because <laughs> because what <laughs> because what we think of as cheese pizza is like you know shitty you know chain restaurant or whatever uh, cheese pizza, and that is not that. So that are, is Neapolitan. So are you saying that the meat, a pepper, a one slice of pepperoni, makes yes. something go from being a pizza to not or not a pizza? It's to a pizza. cheese bread. One it slice, is, is, one <laughs> slice of pepperoni. All right, I need to stop. I need to stop because I'm, I'm, I'm getting. Look, I. So this has been one of the common. You keep. Uh, you also keep calling it cheese pizza. Well, no. So I'm just trying to use words that you will understand. It's not because I think it's pizza. I think it's cheese bread. So hopefully that that clears it I up. I think you should. Go, I think you should go tell Domino's, Pizza Hut, local pizza eateries. All the different types of stuff. Change their signs. 
Make they it, should make it cheese. They bread. should. They they are they are a true <laughs> misinformation campaign. They should be deplatformed <laughs> for for this egregious misrepresentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, if you want if you want that, I'm kind of I'm I'm, I'm not sh- sure this is the best way to sell this, but if you want that and more, uh, that's for one dollar a month. For five dollars a month, you get access to two bonus episodes. So for those, we'll go more in depth around the league. We'll do rankings. We'll talk about the team. Uh, and we're also a lot more unfiltered than we are on the regular show. Although now I'm kind of like that line is starting to get blurred after today's yeah. episode <laughs> <laughs> and, and some of the antics that, that Jake put on the show today. Me? Uh, yeah, you. Um, and then for $15 a month, uh, you are helping us tremendously, tremendously, tremendously. And, uh, that's all at patreoncom slash crash the pond. Now, another way to support us, which is free to you is you can go and leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. And today, we have a new one. And if you do leave this review, we will read it on the show. And we have a new one. We will read it. This one is from Quackers1504. This is from Canada. And I, there's this is significant to me that we got a review it from took Apple. Me, it took me a while to realize what you meant by that when you texted well, me. We've we've shit on multiple... <laughs> like we, I shouldn't say we, we have. We are. We, we, we actively shit on Canadian cities every show. I would maybe shit's a little strong, but you know, we critique them. We certainly critique them. And so that, that people are st- in Canada are still listening to us is a good sign. It shows that we're, we're not too critical. So title of the review is great pod five stars. And here it goes. Best podcast there is. Wow. That, I mean, best Thank open you. to Thank review. You. Best podcast there is. There is no other ducks podcast that comes close I started listening about a year ago, and now I never miss the weekly pod. All the other Ducks podcasts are mostly opinionated and biased, but what makes this podcast so good is that there is no bias, and I love the use of analytics to support all key points. Very smart, clear, and consistent analysis. The viewers' question, the viewer questions portion of the podcast is entertaining as well. Thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm glad you're entertained. Uh, from legitimate questions about the Ducks to rants about Derek Grant and even takes on food, this podcast never seems to fall short of entertaining. I recommend this for any Ducks fan. Thank you. Thank this you. This is a thank great you, review. Thank you. Thank you. This means a lot to us. Yeah, um, especially seeing as the past month or two, we've now really gone into the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know when. When will this experiment run its course? Who knows? Or or maybe this is just the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I feel like maybe I feel like we may- get more Twitter mentions about this than we do about regular uh, podcasts. Anything else? <laughs> anything else? Um, so yeah, leave us a rating on Apple and, uh, we will read it on, or leave us a review on Apple and we read it on the show. Uh, you can also leave us a rating on Spotify. So go ahead and do that. You can find us on YouTube, youtube.com slash crash the pond. You get to see the video version of the show. Um, you get to see all the graphics, the maps of Canadian cities. You get to see, uh, Jake's cat, Jake's attire, his pink hat, all of it. Um, and that's at youtube.com slash crash the pond. Tybal the, Check fe- Tybal the Fiend Blooded says, when are we going to cover American cities? I'm not above finding random American I'm cities. I'm down. I'm down. There's a <laughs> there's there's definitely a, a well that we can tap into yeah. at any time. Um, that means the world is our oyster when it comes to this bit. Yeah. Johnny, um, when you listen to this, give us a UK city. Yes. Okay. And outside of that, check out our website, crashthepond.com. We've grown it. We're going to have a lot of coverage there for the trade deadline uh, in the coming couple weeks here. At Crash the Pond on Twitter, also on Facebook. Jake is on Twitter at Reindeer Games 91 and I'm on Twitter at Felix underscore Sicard. That is going to do it for the show tonight, guys. If you are still listening, uh, almost two hours in now. We appreciate you. We appreciate all of you. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you next Monday. Have Bye.